Hey everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program RP0. This is our uh, Twitch recap episode from last week's live stream, where we were uh, continuing to experiment with uh, some Mars landery things. Uh, again, the goal was reusability, and uh, well, I haven't given up completely on total reusability. This is an idea of uh, partial reusability, where the ascent stage will be parked at Harmonia Station, uh, have its engine swapped after each cycle, and the uh, bottom part, lovingly dubbed uh, the basket, uh, will be used for aero braking through Mars's atmosphere on landing approach, and then of course we'll have the landing legs and all the parachutes and the fun things, and then we'll be used as kind of like a launch pad uh, for the ascent stage. Uh, to return the crew home, and this way we can just bring out a new basket every time we want to launch a crew and uh, attach it to this ascent stage, hopefully, with docking and make things work. Now, our first problem was is that uh, separating the basket and then trying to attach it through the docking ports because it is not assembled with the docking ports as the attached node. Uh, they were a bit misaligned, and if you see in there, there's... Uh, a part of that crew tube that gives us connected living space compliance uh, in the way. So we will tuck that crew tube away, move the docking ports back into position, and then uh, repeat our simulation, which basically the very first step is to uh, decouple the basket and then attach via the docking ports, because, well, this whole idea falls apart if the docking ports are not strong enough to uh, withstand the rigors of reentry and the uh, shoot deploy. Shoot deploy is the big one. So with uh, this next test, we are actually able to successfully decouple and then redock with the basket. It all happened uh, pretty instantaneously, which was um, absolutely awesome, uh, I have to say. And uh, we are actually able to rotate around and make our deorbit burn uh, before switching over to MechJeb's uh, Smart ASS because, man, <laughs> This thing did not like to stay stable, and uh, if we want to get a good um, kind of lift to drag curve, holding between 35 and 40 degrees is, uh, well, just kind of a good idea. So we'll try to rotate around and put the heavy side down. Um, part of the requirements for this vessel was to be able to uh, haul some measure of cargo to the surface. Uh, right now I'm kind of settling on that uh, Kerbal Attachment System command or crate pod thing, the big one, <laughs> the long one, the 2.5 meter. Um, that'll give us a whole lot of room for parts, even so much that we could bring a spare engine down with us uh, if we so chose. I'm hoping we don't have to and we can do all of our uh, engine swaps in orbit, but the option is there. Um, I would much prefer a cargo bay or something similar so that we could bring along a rover perhaps. Um, it's a good bet that any crew landing on this thing will be a couple hundred kilometers off target, and uh, it would be nice for them to not have to walk to whatever their target may be. But uh, anyway, coming through the atmosphere, we're actually uh, fairly stable-ish. Uh, now bringing up the uh, aerodynamic drag uh, indicator display doohickey so that we can get uh, kind of a better look of uh, everything that's going on and how much lift this basket is actually uh, providing for us versus uh, drag. Um, the big number that I was paying attention to was that uh, vertical speed indicator, uh, seeing if we were actually starting to level it out. And turns out, well, we, we were to some extent. I mean, we weren't flying. We didn't generate more lift than drag so as to actually gain altitude, but um, it was doing a pretty good job of uh, slowing our descent down. Now, uh, and if you've been watching the channel for a while now, you know that most of our, all of our Mars landings have pretty much been uh, all engines all the way down. Um, parachutes were there to help kind of mitigate that last little bit, but we'd start firing our engines pretty early. Um, last attempt as high as like a hundred kilometers and just go full burn all the way down. Um, I'm really hoping to get away from that uh, methodology. Well, it works and it's comfortable for me because it, I think it's just, it's easier and it's more predictable and it's, um, 
seemingly a better way to perform targeted landings, as we saw with the uh, supply run drops for the ill-fated Mars base uh, last time we attempted to put Kerbals on Mars. Um, it's not very efficient, and it certainly does take a whole lot of resources to uh, get that much fuel up there to uh, attempt a landing. Um, it was quite a few supply runs in getting that uh, Mars base fueled up enough to where we could actually go for landing. Uh, yeah, I'd really, really like to avoid having to do that. This uh, will refuel off a single resupply pod, um, plus a basket, which... Given our launcher capabilities, I think we could send up all at once. But uh, we're coming up to the important part, which is the stress test and uh, parachute deploy of uh, this particular simulation run. So uh, as we get uh, down to the critical moment, I will turn you back over to old me. All right, where are we at? 1,200 meters per second at 9 kilometers. Yeah, we're coming up on shoot deploy. Uh, I really thought they were supposed to go by now, but oh. There we are. Light it up. Switch this into kill rotation. Oh, hello. Whoa. Okay, well, we actually did pass the rigidity test. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Throttle back. Reset the engine. Light it up. Gear out. Oh, and... Oh, that doesn't look good. Okay, well. Um... Can we find a crew? <laughs> Alright, well, there's a, a critical flaw in this... Dis oh, you... You mother... <laughs> Well, with that uh, first stress test failed, we would uh, jump back into the VAB and see if uh, we could add a couple of struts to this thing. Um, KAS struts were kind of our go-to solution. We'll try just uh, securing the uh, basket to the uh, ascent stage. Um, this is more work on EVA that uh, our poor Kerbal crew will have to do in preparation for their Mars descent, but it is kind of a very mass um, cheap way of uh, hopefully shoring things up a little bit so that we can go ahead and um, make this uh, landing attempt a thing. So we'll we'll throw a drill in there, even though we don't need it, and uh, reboot the simulation um, and jump out to Mars orbit. I did lose the uh, Twitch stream there for a couple of minutes if that jump seemed uh, a little quick. Yeah. It was because, uh, well, we got booted. It did restart, came back online, everything worked fine, but it was a um, panic a couple of minutes, especially on this end. So our uh, deorbit burn has been performed, and we're just uh, coasting around to our, when we uh, hit that thunk of nice Martian atmosphere and then uh, begin our descent all over again. Um, mainly very, very predictable. Um, I guess the Part of the stream that got lost was the Kerbal on EVA shoring up those uh, Kerbal attachment system struts, which uh, I don't know if you can see them very well, but there they are. So our next test, uh, which I figured the best time to do this would be during re-entry, was to make sure Hey Kerbal could transfer from the main crew compartment into the uh, Ingrace, the airlocks? Ingrace, Xgrace hatches uh, towards the uh, bottom of the basket. Um, doesn't do us a whole lot of good if they can't get in or out, which they totally can't because that uh, very stylishly placed radiator is very much in the way of that uh, access hatch. But uh, that's a pretty easy fix that we'll take care of later, provided, of course, that this thing actually passes its, uh, its next stress test. So uh, we can, in fact, move Kerbals around. This thing is fully uh, connected, living space compliant. Some of you will be very happy to know. So, <laughs> uh, man, the reliance on that thing. But anyway, it's a great way to get Kerbals from the bottom to the top of this thing. And, you know, like outside so they can actually move around instead of uh, getting stuck in that 
basket and having to like crawl out through the engine hole thing, which yeah, I think will will honestly work a whole lot better. Now uh, RCS working overtime to maintain this uh, 40 degree pitch vector, which actually is uh, helping slow us down uh, a whole lot better than the 35 or 37 degrees, although it just um, it really doesn't like doing it very much, but we're actually starting to uh, pick up a whole lot of extra drag now as we tear through the atmosphere at four times physics warp, which uh, I thought would calculate drag less based on our experiments with uh, shuttles returning from Earth orbit, but that uh, that doesn't really matter a whole lot. We're actually uh, coming down to sub-30 kilometers and uh, generating not a very insignificant amount of lift, and this thing remaining uh, surprisingly stable through its descent run, which, uh, well, it it kind of shocked me that this thing didn't want to flip around and go nose first. But anyway, we're coming up on the important part of our stress test, which is parachute deploy. So I will go ahead and turn you on over to uh, Old B for live commentary. Nine kilometers altitude. So we should be coming up on our engine light and our parachute deploy very, very soon. I'm so sorry, chat. Oh, Wookie, why do you write a long message right before I have to fire the engines? <laughs> Mostly his vice was stretching yoga. Don't ride a full tuck super sport. Engine light. Uh oh. Stuttering frames means colliders. What the hell happened? Wow. Well, the crew gets now a full two minutes to contemplate their inevitable demise. Traveling at nearly a kilometer per second at six and a half kilometers altitude. We could probably adjust our shoot deployment times to ease this up a bit. No, yeah, well, we won't. I uh, I needed to walk away from that thing. I was getting frustrated. So we are going to turn our attention over to the uh, Origami 4T, uh, now in orbit of Saturn's moon Titan, as it is uh, preparing for its final stages of its uh, primary mission, which is to, of course, fly a glider at Titan, because why the hell not? So uh, we do have uh, a few aerobraking passes that we needed to make uh, in order to, well, get our orbit low enough, we would like to do our glider flight in the daylight side of Titan. Uh, hopefully that also faces Earth. Now, the glider itself has no long-range comms of its own. It's going to be relying entirely on the mothership and also the uh, Tartarus Kronos mothership that is currently in a polar orbit around Titan that uh, also has enough comms, relays, and range to bounce a signal back to Earth um, should our primary mothership be uh, indisposed. Now we we did have a, an initial problem on loading of this vessel in that my action groups had uh, completely disappeared, which was really, 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 really annoying. <laughs> you see, there's no action group selected up there at the uh, top left hand side, which uh, eventually would cause enough frustration for me that I was just going to uh, F5 and F9 to reload the vessel, which. Uh, very graciously restored our action groups to a usable, uh, totally remembered state. I uh, gotta lean into the bugs. That's the that's what we have to remember here is that we just have to lean into the glitches because they are everywhere all the time and they can't let them ruin your day. So uh, we did do a uh, radio in pass this uh, this first orbit and uh, it worked pretty well. Uh, we were able to uh, actually radio in some very excellent money, which uh, we absolutely need for how broke we are and how much those simulations at Mars cost us. They're like uh, 25, 26 grand a piece. So we really need to make up the difference um, and pay for those simulations because we have a Mars window coming up and that's going to consist of some very expensive launches, um, which is always always fun. Anyway, there was our F9 and uh, reload and 
we have our action groups back, which makes queuing up science for our next pass, which is uh, actually going to be a legitimate arrow breaking pass to at least put the mothership in a nice lower orbit uh, so that it can maintain com comms range with uh, even the service of Titan. Uh, once we have achieved our periapsis, or our apoapsis, I'm sorry, uh, for the mothership that we will like, we will eventually, not this episode, but in a future episode, uh, decouple the glider and let it continue to make uh, arrow breaking passes uh, all on its own while we circularize the mothership in a uh, nice high slow orbit so that we can have a nice uh, long window of being above where the glider makes its uh, final entry path uh, across Titan. Uh, we would like to maintain consistent comms. We're going to be doing a lot of radio ins uh, during that flight path, hopefully covering at least two biomes. Uh, we are going to be taking a look at the map uh, provided to us by the Tartarus Kronos mission and uh, see if we can't get a nice uh, flight plan that takes us across as many biomes as possible. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to kind of cover some lakes some shores, maybe even some mountains. I think uh, on our or original Titan landing, we got like two biomes on the way down. And I want to say they were lowlands and highlands. Not very interesting, but for our first time putting something uh, in the dirt there, it was nonetheless very, very exciting. And uh, of course, Saturn never uh, lets you down when it comes down to the uh, the eye candy. But we are starting our arrow break pass in earnest, which means we can radio in some really nice atmospheric science. And uh, all of this is being relayed back to Earth by the uh, Tartarus Kronos mothership in orbit, which was uh, super, super convenient. Its uh, orbital path right now is such that it always has a view of Earth uh, at every point in its orbit, and we almost always have a view of it. Um, because it is polar and we are not. So we did kind of luck out here with that, although that situation may change by the time we get our, our glider uh, actually in the position to uh, make its atmospheric entry and uh, start its data recording path. So with uh, the just a little kick of the RCS, I should say. Uh, we we're able to uh, set this thing into a spin, which of course increases its drag coefficient uh, exponentially with all this buffing and swaying around and really stressing out the frame on this thing. Uh, we do create a lot more drag, which will uh, help pull that periapsis down to uh, something a lot more manageable. And well, I think uh, at this point, uh, most of our radio winds, the only thing we're getting back is our biological data samples, which we kind of like to save until, I don't know, the very last minute. I don't know why I cling to those so hard, but uh, the two on the glider, absolutely, we will be uh, hanging on to for as long as we possibly can. Just, um, you know, we want to radio those in from the surface, or we want to radio at least one from flying low and then one from the surface. It'd be nice if they could cover different biomes, but that's really neither here nor there. So I know this uh, tumbling around is getting a little unnerving, but uh, as the speed picks up, and we already are on our way back up, we've only got probably another 40 or so kilometers to climb, uh, we did see some very... Uh, good returns on this. We're actually uh, about one more arrow breaking pass away from having that uh, mothership where we want it. Uh, I would like about a four million meter periapsis. That's well within comms range of everything and the orbit's still high enough to uh, be a several hour orbit, which means hopefully our glide time won't exceed our coverage time of our mothership, or at least the time in which we could uh, be bouncing signals from uh, our polar satellite in orbit, uh, as well as our mothership. Hopefully we'll be able to cross range the two and uh, get good coverage for the very near future when this glider makes its actual flight. So that's going to do it for this one, everyone. Thank you so much for hanging out. I really do appreciate it. And I will see all of you in the next one. So till then, see you later.